Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc. I'm here today with uh, John Roberts, who is a professor here at uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business, author of countless articles, um, and also uh, you've got these wonderful books, which I think summarize a lot of your research and related research uh, in ways that are accessible. So we've got this textbook here, Economics, Organization, and Management, which was um, a textbook in one of my classes for, for many years. Now it's out of print, sadly. And then, of course, this book, um, The Modern Firm, which is a series of, of lectures. And, you know, what's remarkable about this book is that there is, uh, I mean, there isn't a single equation in here, but there are a couple pictures. And so I, I, I was... I was like, wait, I, need, I want more pictures, right? <laughs> because it's very hard for me to talk about these things um, without pictures. But um, this book is still still amazing, and I was just rereading it, and uh, and it made well, me you. made me realize how much of what you have done over the years in organizational economics has kind of become almost like part of my operating system. You yeah. know, and I use all these concepts in that's, my classes. So that's, thanks. That's a wonderful compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, John, I wanted to. Um, start off just by asking you maybe to go back in time, right? Because, you know, you've, uh, maybe not single-handedly, but along with a bunch of your colleagues created this entire area of economics, really, which is mm -hmm. organizational economics. And, you know, you were inspired by folks like Coase. But, you know, Coase and some of the other folks who were asking these questions, I mean, they were not really part of the, the modern economics no. methodology, right? They didn't, they didn't attempt to you know, formalize their, their insights. They didn't, uh, you know, create models that you could, you could test and that you could evaluate and build on. And so, you know, tell us a little bit about the early days of, of how, or, you know, organizational economics came to be as a, as a, as a discipline. Um, well, for me, it was part of a, uh, an intellectual journey. Uh, I started out as a mathematical economist and wrote probably the most irrelevant PhD dissertation ever. Um, but then I was hired by a business school mm -hmm. and I started off teaching just ordinary uh, vanilla accepted economics. Uh, and, but I, uh, you know, talking, working with, with kids who were going to be managers, I got more interested in real competition. Um, so I, I did some stuff in IO, um, and that, uh, that actually was was very uh, influential. The uh, bringing the what we did, Paul Milgram and I brought. Um, the theory of games with incomplete information mm -hmm. uh, into to uh, no no we didn't bring it into economics but we brought it into looking at mm -hmm. competition and and uh, things like that. Um, Vickery had come up with it long time ago before it was ever formalized as as games of incomplete information um, and. Bob Wilson and um, at least some of his students were doing stuff like that, but around auctions, mm -hmm. uh, the stuff that he, he and Paul won the Nobel Prize for. Um, so anyway, I started doing that and uh, I um, started getting involved with firms. Mm -hmm. Uh, just because um, I felt so ignorant. Mm -hmm. um, I was working out of a textbook that had all the, it was an encyclopedic textbook by Fred Shearer. Um, and it had all the stuff in there, but there was not much empirical stuff and nothing like case studies. And so I... Uh, I started, when I came here, I started a course, uh, a MBA elective on um, 
on organizations. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it was it was sort of an MBA elective and incomplete information, but but uh, the stuff I'd done was IO like so questions of whether uh, limit pricing makes sense or whether whether uh, predatory pricing might make sense, mm-hmm. which Chicago had decreed that neither of those made sense, so they didn't exist. So the antitrust people stopped worrying about them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started spending time with, with firms. Um, and uh, mostly just um, hanging out inside the firm and asking questions and looking at how they do things. So uh, um, Well, for example, I spent a lot, spent a lot of weeks in December and January of ninety of uh, eighty four, eighty five, in uh, in Helsinki, looking at what Nokia did, mm-hmm. and uh, I got particularly involved with British Petroleum. Yeah, um, John Brown, who's who was the the uh, the guy who turned BP around and took it from a fourth-rate oil company to a you know, massive energy mm-hmm. company. Um, he he was chairman of the advisory council here. He's an alum of the school, and. Uh, I appealed to him, and he basically gave me run of the company. Uh, so I was, I talked to lots of people, and then I ended up organizing um, an executive program for BP that BP sent. I think it was two hundred of their managers through it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got to know a lot of those people, and I got to know. Um, Got to know General Motors. Uh, I got to um, Cummins Engine mm-hmm. and uh, all kinds of companies, Toyota, Sony. Well, one of the things that comes out of your work, if you dig deep, is you get an appreciation for how difficult management actually is. I mean, these decisions mm-hmm. like – you know, around the size and scope of the firm. I mean, what 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 activities should they be engaged in, right? How do you divisionalize things? How do you design incentive schemes? I mean, these things are exceptionally difficult. And, and yet, I think most people think that um, managers do this stuff almost I- intuitively, right? So... It, I think a lot do. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so, I mean, is part of what economists do, are, are they just sort of... Um, seeing that something works in practice and then they just try to figure out how See if it works, works in theory. theory, right? I mean, is that part? Because there's, there seems to be, there's a descriptive part, which is just sort of explaining why things are the way they are. But then there's also this prescriptive part, which is, hey, you know, here are some techniques that you can use to to improve the, the quality of your management. Uh-huh. I mean, do you see your, your work as, 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 as being, you know, more descriptive or, or more, more prescriptive? Both. Mm-hmm. It's both. Um... Uh, I think um, one of the one of the empirical facts that's come out and become well established is that there are huge differences in productivity mm-hmm. across firms, even across uh, plants in the same firm, mm-hmm. and this is true not just of high tech or or complex technologies. It's true in ice block mm-hmm. and white bread. There's uh, this one stu- study you were involved in where uh, you did an experiment in India, right? Yeah. Where you went to these managers of textile mills and mm-hmm. gave some of them a little basic <laughs> management education and, right. and their productivity took off. That's right. That was, that was uh, an important study because um, – People had seen this Mm -hmm. variation in productivity, and a lot of people said, oh, it's probably management. Mm -hmm. But, um, 
you know, uh, you could have other explanations. And a few were floated. But this actually established cause and effect because mm -hmm. it was a randomized controlled trial and we, some of them got help and some of them didn't. And the ones that got help did way, way better than they were before and way better than mm -hmm. the, the ones who were in the, in the control group. Mm -hmm. um, and now, uh, experimental work on organizations is pretty difficult because it's, it's first of all, uh, getting a company to try one thing and, and, in, and not uh, for only in what part of the organization. Right. The other is, folks are be like, what's going on over there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they're expensive. We spent $1.8 million on that India study. Right. So, I mean, is, it, you can imagine a world where you do clinical trials on all of these yeah. you know, ideas that, that we cook up in, in business school. That'd be kind of a cool, cool yeah. universe, right? Yeah. And that's what the India study was. Mm -hmm. It was a, a clinical trial. Um, but again, it cost an arm and a leg because we were paying for consultants to go in mm -hmm. and hold their hands mm -hmm. for several months. Um, and, you know, most firms are not willing to, to, uh, make those ex run experiments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, uh, one of my other well, papers. They'll, well, they'll run experiments, I think on relatively incremental changes, you know, yeah. let's, let's tinker with the font size or tinker with an email campaign, but, you know, tinkering with your organizational architecture yeah. is, is pretty tough. Yeah. Um. We were lucky in that um, one of our PhD students, a guy named James Liang, had been uh, had started this outfit called C Trip in mm -hmm. in uh, China, which was a travel agency, and he um, and he got it. We built it up to the biggest travel agency in China, and he got bored and came back and did a PhD with us and uh, learned about the India study. And um, he, he was, he actually had a job at University of Chicago, but the board asked him to come back because the company had fallen apart without him. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had one of our PhD students who was interested in experiments running this company. So he let us run an experiment where some people worked from home and some people stayed in the office and they measured the effect that that had. And, uh, it had a big impact. Mm -hmm. Um, these are people in the call centers and they, their, uh, their output went up considerably, mm -hmm. like, as I remember on the order of 10, 12%. And they decided that this was a success. So they um, said, anybody who wants to work from home can do so. We'll supply mm -hmm. the, the uh, computer for you to do it, uh, phone bills. Um, but if you don't, you're welcome to come back to the office. So then you get both the, the incentive effects and the selection effects, mm -hmm. because the people who do it are the ones who want to do it. And that ended up giving a 25% increase in output. Mm -hmm. Astronomical. But it seems kind of puzzling, right? You know, you'd think that some Darwinian process, I mean, if, if you have all these different experiments being run in different organizations and, mm -hmm. and some of them, you know, are successful, I mean, in, the way we teach it in our classes if, is if, you know, one organization stumbles on something that works, then all the other organizations are just going to copy it. Right. But, but we don't see that. We see well, like a, we see much slower than expected diffusion yes, in terms yes. of, you know, I, ideas. I absolutely agree. Um, I think some of it is, um, 
the way we put together organizations, they aren't built to explore, to explore, mm -hmm. to, uh, to do things, to look for different things to do and do things differently. Uh, you know, if you're measured by this quarter's stock price or whatever, mm -hmm. um, spending, you know, risking your business by trying out some guy's idea that may have worked in his industry and his company, uh, there's nothing in it for you. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, uh, the return system uh, for the decision makers is bad for that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think when you start thinking about more turbulent environments, like high tech, um, things are things are changing all the time. So there's you you can't sit on an old fa an old fashioned way mm -hmm. of doing things, but you can try and fail. That's what Nokia did. Nokia went from uh, a bit player in ninety industries to totally focusing on on uh, mobile communication. Mm -hmm. And they went from near bankrupt in 91 to the most valuable company in Europe by 2000. Mm -hmm. And they had completely wiped Motorola out of the market. But they missed the <laughs> clamshell. Mm -hmm. They had their way of doing it and it was a smaller and smaller brick. And the clamshell came along. Nokia didn't make it. And Nokia's market share went like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's now only makes switches. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make phones anymore. Because they stuck to what they knew how to do. Even though uh, everybody else seemed to think that, that clams are the way to go. Well, you know, you, you mentioned Explore, and of course, you know, you, you cite Jim March and the famous Explore versus Exploit dichotomy, but, you know, he wasn't an economist. And, and uh, you know, when, when we think of organizational theory, I mean, organizational economics kind of bleeds into these things that we sometimes think of as having to do with, you know, with culture and yeah. with norms and, and beliefs and, uh -huh. and, 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 um, and knowledge. Um, I mean, how important is it that you 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 take this kind of integrated approach to, to understanding organizations? I mean, can, if you is is there a danger that if you focus on one interpretive framework too narrowly, you're, you're going to miss a lot of the of what's going on? I guess, um, but uh, can can everything be incorporated into? you know, our, our economics models, just can we, can we import the, the insight? Well, if we play a bit with the models, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the people who are doing behavioral economics, um, not many of them are modeling, but they're, uh, they're finding stuff mm -hmm. experimentally in the, it, typically in the lab rather than in the field. Um, but you can bring stuff in from that and you can, uh, I mean, I've come to the position that probably the most important thing in an organization is the culture. Mm -hmm. Now I may be drummed out of the perf economics profession for, for saying that, but, uh, um, it really, uh, if you have a, a strong culture that really determines the way people think, the way people interact, what kinds of, of what things they'll do and mm -hmm. what things they won't do and what they'll put up with and, and uh, how, how much they focus on today versus tomorrow, and whole range of things that, uh, um, that can be much more important than the than the formal architecture or the mm -hmm. established uh, routines. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if I if I think of what what your contribution, I think of you as the um, the 
the the articulator of of fit, right? So yeah. you know, I I talk about complementarity all the time. It's mm-hmm. kind of my I'm, I'm broken record because I'm always talking about this, and you know, you formalized this idea of complementarity. So people have always talked about you know having a fit between you know, strategy and structure. People talk about having a fit between, you know, the architecture and the culture. And they talk about having a fit between, you know, this characteristic and that characteristic. And, um, but, you know, all those conversations, they they were, they were, I guess, you know, they weren't formalized, right? And you really kind of formalized it. So why is it, I mean, what is it that was standing in the way of economics really getting into, the 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 shape of of complementarity right what is it about the, the the basic economic modeling techniques that that make it difficult to ingest complementarities well i mean economists have always known about complementarity uh you get it in your first lecture on mm-hmm. demand mm-hmm. Uh, how the price of one good affects the demand mm-hmm. for another good and um But uh, economists have not typically thought much in terms of systems. Mm-hmm. Um, they they tend to the the nature of economic modeling is uh, Occam's razor: make it as make it cut it down to to as few variables as possible, and get those right. That's fine if you don't have a lot of interaction Mm -hmm. between that variable and other ones that are going on around you. Um, And what the the uh, stuff, the work you're referring to, that that um, actually was was started by mathematical programmers here in our engineering school, um, lattice optimization. And um, and then Paul and I kind of brought it into economics, um, and that that it's very 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 simple mathematics, much simpler than than standard economic modeling, because um, you don't have to assume everything's smooth and differentiable. You don't have to assume that choice sets or convex or all the stuff that goes into the standard models. Um, and you can, you're led to naturally think about the interactions between variables because that's what lattices are about. Mm-hmm. That if this is here and that's there, then that one and that mm-hmm. one, um, that didn't make any sense when the picture, <laughs> but if, if you got this and you got this, then in a lattice, you also have this mm-hmm. and that, okay? So, uh, and those different points would have different payoffs. And th- so that means that the payoffs to doing this mm-hmm. depend on whether you've done this or not. Well, but that, that, makes, that means that, you know, if you have a, a, a coherent strategy, that means that, you know, all, all the parts kind of fit together, but that, that, that makes it... Um, you know, difficult to kind of switch, right? I mean, it, you, you get you get stuck in these, you know, local maximums, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's one of the, I mean, economics old style assumed enough to get, the, if there was a, a zero on the derivative. You'd find it. You found it. Yeah. You found it. Yeah. Uh, and it had a lot of trouble dealing with, <laughs> with this kind of picture. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, you found a zero here and you stay there. And that's, you know, if you're doing local search mm-hmm. as a manager, you know, thinking about changing things a little mm-hmm. doesn't make any sense because everywhere you look, if you're not looking all the way out there, you can't do better. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, the, the, uh, the car industry from the 20th century. Um, you know, uh, Henry Ford built a system 
that fit together beautifully. Okay, it it you know it created the industry, mm -hmm. um, and the whole business of vertical integration and and uh, the assembly line and and uh, the uh, all all of what he did. Um, was the right way to do it at the time. Until it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then the environment changed. Mm -hmm. You know, technology changed as to what what you could do. Um, and consumer tastes became more varied. You know, Ford would sell you anything as long as it was a black bottle tea. Mm -hmm. um, you look at Toyota and the, you know, of 80, 90 years later, they're making 350 engine variants on a single assembly line, mm -hmm. one at a time, different. So there's huge opportunity for flexibility and using that flexibility to meet consumer demand mm -hmm. or customer demand. Um, and that, that was uh, one of these pictures. The world had looked like that for Henry Ford, but then this new part grew. And uh, Toyota somehow stumbled on it. It was, they didn't have a, um, a map of what they had to do. They just started out trying to get rid of waste. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were forced into some uh, use of outside suppliers by Japanese government uh, and all the pieces of outsourcing, flexible manufacturing and uh, everything we think of as Toyota manufacturing system, which is now modern manufacturing. Um, they, they, they worked it out. Once they got over here somewhere, then they crept around until they found the, the peak. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in my strategy classes, I, I preach the importance of commitment and then I preach the importance of flexibility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this, of course, the logical question the students ask is, well, okay, yes, so how, do you yeah. do, how do you do both, right? Uh-huh, that's, that's a pretty good question. <laughs> if you can solve that problem, then yeah. you know, you'll, you'll, be, uh, you'll be super wealthy, Yeah. right? But I mean, look, if, you, if you're building out a, a, a large organization and mm -hmm. you have a division of labor and you have everybody with distinct responsibilities, I mean, don't you kind of have to give them sort of, you know, single peaked kind of reward systems to some degree? I mean, isn't it sort of the nature of the beast that that at least the, the individuals within the organization, they, they, they can only see that little piece of the organization? And, um, and and you're kind of stuck giving them rewards and incentives that, that um, are comprehensible to them? Well, yeah. Um, you can't run a centralized, top-down hierarchic organization that's of any size, even if the technology weren't changing on you, the environment changing on you. Um, even it, with the best communication technology, best information technology, you, the, you can't get the information from here to here. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a lot of decisions within the bowels of the, of the business. And, uh, that means you have to make sure that the system is set up so that these decisions here are compatible with decisions mm -hmm. that the other guy's making over here. And that that's a delicate thing to do. Um, BP made it work in, in BP uh, exploration, the drilling part, uh, production part. Um, what they did is they had had a massive um, hierarchy with a matrix form and uh, they got rid of all of it. Mm -hmm. there, there was a executive committee with three people on it. 
And then there were the individual managers of assets, uh, like an oil field or a drilling rig. And those guys down there were incentivized to find ways to cut cost. Because that's all that matters in the business is getting your costs down and your volumes up because you have no control over the price. The, the even Exxon mm -hmm. doesn't have control of the price very much. It's a world market. Um, and that worked pretty well. In fact, it worked exceptionally well in the original business. Didn't work so well when they tried to implement it in, in uh, the distribution business, in the gas stations and whatnot, because uh, people expected a certain, you know, you pull into a, a McDonald's and you get McDonald's. Mm -hmm. You pull into BP, you should get a BP experience. Mm -hmm. Um, so it didn't work nearly as well there and it, uh, but you know, the, for all my praising of BP and in, in the modern firm, you know, the, the comeback is, well, what about deep sea horizon? Mm -hmm. And there, I think it was a cultural failure. I think the problem was a cultural failure. The, uh, most of the people working in BP in the US were people who'd come over from Standard Oil when BP bought Standard Oil. And Standard, BP worked on the basis that uh, you negotiated with the executive committee your objectives for the year in terms of cost, volume, safety, environment. And they would push hard on you. And you were supposed to push back. If you couldn't do it, you weren't supposed to take it on. You were supposed to say, I won't, can't do that. And they actually organized these managers together into groups for mutual support <laughs> and information sharing, <laughs> but also to support each other, right. to tell the bosses, this, this guy is not sandbagging, this is real. On the other hand, Standard Oil had been organized in a very command and control way, at least relative to BP. You got your objectives for the year and you met them or you were in big trouble. You didn't get to negotiate them. So if you got something you couldn't do, you found some way to do it and typically if that's, if what you're after is cost and volume, well, what can you, what can you cut back on to, to, uh, meet those volume demands safety. And I think what my belief is that what happened, uh, is that the manager, the asset manager of, of Deepwater Horizon, when it was being built, was being pushed to keep the capital expenditure down and they cut corners. Mm -hmm. And when they cut corners, they polluted the, the Gulf and destroyed BP's reputation. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you talk a lot about influence activities, right? That's yeah. a big, big part of your, your work. And yeah, we all know anybody who's worked in an organization, you know, knows, knows what this is is all about. Yeah. Um, but it seems like in order for an organization to work effectively, they have to have a, a conscious strategy for, you know, minimizing the, the negative effects of th this influencing activity. So now, look, you need to get information from people, yeah. but information and influence are kind of stapled yeah, together. Yeah. So yes. how do you how do you build out an organization that that allows for the collection of, of information from the people on the ground, but resists the, all those influence activities. Yeah. So, um, well, it depends a, a bit on what kind of influence activities it is. If it's, you know, uh, buttering up the boss, mm -hmm. um, 
you make sure your managers have backbone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty simple. Uh, the more complicated thing is when, when the information is is inter is subject to manipulation. Mm -hmm. The information that the down in the organization can be manipulated advantageously for the mm -hmm. the manager doing it, and uh, that was part of what BP was trying to to do with this pressure down but support for resistance mm -hmm. up. Um, so and uh, you know you can you can. In, in any one instance, it's going to be hard to separate those out. Um, the whole theory of mechanism design is an attempt to, to figure out what you can do in that regard, though they mostly focus on, on uh, auctions and selling devices and whatnot, allocation mechanisms. Um, but just remembering that there's a tomorrow and if you screw around today and we learn about it, we'll punish you tomorrow is uh, a way to start it. Mm -hmm. But if it becomes endemic in the culture, um, you know, like, uh, oh, I, I, I hasten to, to, uh, to try and blame somebody for having that problem. Uh, one believes bureaucracies in government have it, but I'm sure bureaucracies in business have it. And uh, you, the only thing you can do, I think, is, is try and build an alignment, um, which comes not just from the, the monetary compensation, but by uh, the culture by people getting the, the respect and, and, uh, admiration of their, of the other people in the organization. Well, you know, at, at the time when you, you were writing both these books, I mean, it was pretty clear that we were undergoing a massive, um, information revolution, right? Oh. And it's only accelerated. Um, and, and I remember back then, you know, when I was in grad school, you know, half the people said that, ah, this is going to allow for, uh, you know, lower agency costs and, um, you know, better collection of information from the periphery to the center. And therefore, you're going to have, you know, bigger, bigger firms. And then, of course, you know, the other side was like, no, no, no. All of this lower information cost is going to allow for more complex markets, right? And, you know, lower transaction costs. And and so, uh, you know, it seems like both of those are are kind of kind of true, right? We, we see more well, complex markets and bigger organizations to some degree. Yeah, um, Nick Plum and John Van Rienen have a very important paper in this regard. Um, it differentiates communication technology from information technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, improving communication technology uh, has radically different effects than improving information technology. So um, I think that's what happened was that people didn't see communication technology and information technology as separate things. Mm. They just saw them as the internet. So wait, so one of them is going to help uh, with encourage firm. centralization. Uh -huh. The other encourages decentralization. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember which is which. <laughs> uh, but um, I think that was a big part of what was going on, that, that we weren't asking the right question. Mm -hmm. We were just talking about technology. We weren't talking about the s specific technologies that were involved. Mm -hmm. Well, well, also, I mean, there, there's oftentimes we see a division of labor between the people who are thinking about the organization of the public sector and, and folks in, in the private sector. But it, it seems like there's there's complementarities there. And, and, and you talk a bit in the India article about how, you know, um, 
sort of a lack of rule of law made it difficult for these organizations to, you know, achieve any kind of scale yeah. in, in, in India. So, you know, when we're looking at the kind of contrasting organizational structures in, say, you know, U.S. versus Japan or, you know, different geographies, how much of that is is due to sort of a complementarity with the the, the, broad, the broader ecosystem? Yeah, I think uh, I think the ecosystem, the environment, is uh, crucial. I mean, um, we already talked about Ford versus Toyota. Mm -hmm. and that was a matter that the environment was different. The technology and the, the demand environments were different. Um, but uh, there's... There's, a, I think, a tendency to overestimate the extent to which systems are embedded in the in the environment. Um, you know, Toyota was very nervous about coming to the U.S. And that's why they had the uh, uh, Numi joint venture mm -hmm. with with GM because they weren't sure that American workers were honest and hardworking. I mean, what's amazing about Numi is that they, they actually did not replace the workforce. I mean, they kept more they or less. Absolutely. And every one of them. And you saw this dramatic increase in, in performance. It's, yes. it's it's kind of remarkable, right? Yeah. Uh, now, partly that was, um, you know, they had a long history of distrust mm -hmm. between the workers and GM. And... Um, Toyota made a big effort to bring in people from Japan, workers from Japan, uh, to talk, to work with these guys and to talk about what it was like to work for mm -hmm. Toyota. And Toyota had this reputation that we don't do layoffs and things like that. And the workers said, okay, if you're not going to screw me over, I'll be cooperative with you and we'll work harder. Mm -hmm. Well, now I, I know a lot of some of my friends from business school would go in and take over these companies um, that were, you know, they were poorly managed and they would alter the management and increase the performance and then, you know, exit. Yeah. And so it's, is, is, is improvement in performance, I mean, does it usually travel with the people or can we come up with better ways of transferring knowledge without having to, because I mean, in Toyota, I mean, you actually brought in yeah. these these managers, right? Instead of just... Well, no, you it wasn't the managers. It was the line staff. Right. The workers. But couldn't they couldn't they just put, okay, here's a they set They brought of, in new managers. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. But I mean, you, is is this, is it necessarily tacit knowledge? I mean, couldn't you put the, the tools and techniques into a series of you know, bullet points and, you know, hand it over, <laughs> like here's your textbook well, and your... tools and techniques, certainly. <laughs> yeah. But the the point of the Numi example is that it wasn't tools and techniques. Yeah. It was, and it wasn't the people, it wasn't the architecture. It was the culture. Do we mm -hmm. trust each other or not? And uh, that's something that's going to be pretty hard to... Uh, digitalize. Mm -hmm. I think it has to involve face-to-face -face involvement, you know, because uh, you know, I, d I don't know the president of the university from Adam, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I know the dean and I trust him mm -hmm. and I hope that he knows the president <laughs> and uh, has got an eye on him. Hmm. Um, so I think, well, obviously the consulting industry is an attempt to do this, to get around the need to put in a whole new set of managers. Yeah, well, so what's interesting to me is, um, you know, if you go to, say, Citadel, I remember one time I went to visit Citadel and I was walking around the hallways and everyone was reading Journal of Finance. You know, mm -hmm. you see stacks of printouts, <laughs> Journal of Financial Economics, Journal of Finance, and then these folks would, you know, go and, and trade 
based on insight that they had taken from academia. And, you know, some of your colleagues were, you know, important transmitters of this expertise. And it, and it seems like the, the world of finance has, has been, has had their ear to, you, you know, academia and there's this direct transmission. But if you, if you walk into the CEO of, you know, General Motors office, uh -huh. you, you're not going to find, you know, your, your article. So, no. so, ha <laughs> so why is it that in, in certain areas like finance, there's money and, to be and, made well, and in operations research, right? Yeah. You know, there's, there's this, yeah. but when it comes to the, the really, I think of them as even you know, more important decisions, like how do you design your organization? Um, why isn't there that, that, that direct transmission mechanism from, from academia um, it's well, a little bit more convoluted, right? Well, um, there there is. In strategy professors, marketing professors, HR people, they consult all the time. Mm -hmm. So there is that. Uh, that isn't, but it's, I mean, the great advantage of of finance in this regard is that it's, it is very much routines. Mm -hmm. It's, this is how the way you do it. And it's, you know, it can be written down in a textbook and, and, uh, you can go out and follow the rules and you'll, you'll get the results. Um, management is a whole lot more complex than that. So, carrying it hmm. from that to the CEO's office, uh, unless it's John Brown, who uh, read the whole book and commented on it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, you know, it's just, it, you can't package it up and, and hand it to someone. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, and that's a, that's a, matter that it's such a complex system. The, the, what goes into the organization, what goes into the strategy, how they connect, how they fit into the environment. Those, those are not like, uh, you know, watch your alpha and pay attention to beta. And mm -hmm. So in a way, because it's, it's more complex. It needs to, it needs to go through, you know, lots of different filters and arrive at the at the C-suite through different channels. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, the kind of, I've done programs for, I mentioned BP. Uh, I did a similar program for uh, Deutsche Telekom. I've done... Um, I've done a couple of other companies and that's the, the problem with that. I mean, you can transmit the, the knowledge and it's very good when you're working with a single company in a classroom of, of peers, because they share the experiences and they can say that makes sense in our company or that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. in our company or how could we do it in our company? Um, the, uh, so executive education is, is one mechanism mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's probably better than at, at fundamental change if you're after it than consulting because consulting, typically you have a client in the firm. Mm -hmm in the firm you're working for. <laughs> and uh, you want to get done what she wants done. Mm -hmm. And you don't interact with, other than to treat the other people in the organization as a source of information, you don't really interact with them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no shared experience in the company with the idea. Uh, and I, so I think in fact, that's uh, that's an area that's that's um, I think has tremendous opportunities. Uh, it's not an easy sell, and it uh, uh, 
it involves pulling a whole lot of people out of the organization at one time, which means it can't go on for more than a couple of weeks mm-hmm. and uh, or even a week. Um, and that may not be enough to to really get the thing going. Right, but, but I think, you know, with, with strategy and types of decisions you're talking about, I mean, if, if it were just a sense, if it was just a matter of responding to local signals and adjusting, you know, the dial this way or that way, then it, it wouldn't require, you know, vision or courage. You talk about the importance of vision and courage as a, as a strategic leader. Um, so it, it really requires that, that these leaders have the capacity to kind of pull back and, uh, and and look at things from a perspective that is somewhat removed from mm-hmm. from from the day to day. I mean, this seems like a difficult thing. I mean, not only is management difficult, but it seems like strategy is even more difficult because you have to somehow carve out the time to remove yourself from the the pressures of of your your day to day role. Yeah, if you're going to keep your strategy fresh, um, yeah, it's. Uh, you know, if you, and so, um, and I, I think that you, you, you ought to think about designing strategy and designing the organization together. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is a very complicated problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think opportunities for senior managers to get away from things for a while are probably important and underdeveloped. Uh, I don't. My guess is that that uh, classroom education isn't the right way. Um, because the the tendency is to prepare for the class. Mm-hmm. You don't have you've got more time than usual, but you don't really have a chance to sit back. Uh, but it might it might be an element of it. Um, so some some combination of of uh, of like small group class activities where there are a bunch of your peers and you're talking about big ideas combined with, with, uh, coaching, mm-hmm. um, where you have somebody who like you asks good questions. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about the place of strategy and organizations in the business school curriculum, because I mean, you know, strategy isn't that old. It, it, it I think it was in corp. I think I took it in one of its first years. I think it was ninety one when I was in school. We had a course on strategy, and you know, some schools are even dropping strategy from the their core curricula. Um, and even in these strategy classes, organizations are kind of an afterthought. Yeah. Right? Most uh, it's most of it's yeah, kind that's of that's because people are trained in strategy. Yeah, but it's so it's okay. Here's how we interact with the. The, the environment and our competitors and, you know, our suppliers and so forth. But the I, I look through some of the curricula and some of the business schools and th- there isn't actually anywhere in, in, in the curriculum where they, they say, okay, here's where we talk about, you know, boundaries of the firm. <laughs> here's where we talk about, okay, are we going to do a geographic division or are we going to do a functional division? Like that stuff is, and, and, I'm, and I'm kind of perplexed because this seems to be what so many senior managers are, are focused on? How do uh-huh. I design the compensation scheme? How do I design, you know, the, the priorities? How do I build a culture? So is, is it because it's, is it because it's hard? I mean, is, is, is that, is that it? Could be. Or is it that uh, it doesn't have a nice place within the, um, you know, the, the, the divisionalization of our research? Yeah, that's a large part of it, I think. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't think most economists think organizational econ- economics exists, <laughs> or if it does, they don't see why. Um, Ed Lazier managed to make personnel economics work for a while, but Ed was really the driving force. And there are lots of people, young people who, who do 
studies of of how how firms interact with their employees mm -hmm. rather than just standard labor market economics where this is the shape of the the uh, of the age distribution of the employments in the country um, but there's no leadership there anymore uh, there's Ollie Williamson was the natural would have been natural leader, but he was so focused on getting his own stuff a Nobel Prize that he he uh, he didn't have much effect on the rest of economics. Mm -hmm. um, you heard him talk about about uh, transactions costs and uh, whatnot, and it's like. Like Coase said in, in before, uh, well, I, I guess it was around 1990 that he commented that the the nature of the firm was the most highly had the highest ratio of citations to reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully uh, we we can reverse that. I mean, but but really, you have organizational economics, but you have information economics. You have mm -hmm. mechanism design. Yeah, you know, there's um contract theory. I mean, the, these are all different terms for things that ultimately are, are themselves complementary, right? Yes, I, I, I believe that, that uh, most of contract theory could be it brought in under org econ. Personnel economics to me is clearly a subset of org econ. Um, a lot of corporate governance is the mm -hmm. way uh, but th there, it's, it is not a yet a really established way for people to do economics mm -hmm. or to ask those questions in economics. They're asked in business schools. You know, there are strategy groups. There are strategy scholars. There are organization behavior people who sometimes think about these issues. Um, so they get some attention, but they get no attention in economics departments. Mm -hmm. I think MIT is the only place in, in the country where you can get uh, organizational economics as one of your fields. Mm -hmm. And whether that will survive Bank Holmstrom's retirement, uh, I don't know, but I if it does, it won't survive Bob Gibbons retirement. Mm. Well, uh, last question, you know, when you wrote this book on the modern firm, you know, you're, you're highlighting sort of um, a, a trend, which was sort of the um, distribution of decision making into lower levels and the creation mm -hmm. of smaller, smaller teams and um, maybe more of a uh, flatter hierarchy and so forth. Um, we, you know, this is before we saw the rise of of Amazon and of Apple and and mm -hmm. Microsoft and you know we have these firms that monopolize the S and P five hundred. Were you surprised at all by the the emergence of these of these firms? I mean, they they have a yeah. they have a they're they're big obviously, but they they do have a management structure which is different from what you saw in say General Motors and back yeah. in the day, right? Yeah. Um, well, frankly, I'm not that up to date on it. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the the well, first of all, the size is not that great if you're looking at GDP rather than <laughs> stock market. Mm -hmm. Okay, but um, the the way that Amazon has taken over retailing, I think, has surprised people. Uh, it certainly surprised me. I did. I didn't think that I would would uh, a pre would go for shopping online. My wife, on the other hand, gets four to five packages a day. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And it's everything from our groceries to mm -hmm. toilet paper to cosmetics mm -hmm. to clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've bought a pair of shoes and sent them back. And that's been about the extent of my online purchases. Well, you know, so, I, I like to joke that if, if they had a Nobel Prize in management, which, uh -huh. which they don't, right? If they did, then I think Jeff Bezos and Andy Jassy might have to be the first uh, recipients. It could be. Because, I mean, these folks are creating these incredibly powerful organizational f forms, yeah. but but they, they don't, they do it in, in a way that is not explicitly theorized, right? And and so yeah. so there's this. It's part of our job is to figure out how to explain what it is that they're doing, yeah. and then and then ultimately, uh, you know, that helps others to to learn from it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, listen. It's not my fault. <laughs> I, you know, I hope uh, these books are fantastic. I hope that we can somehow figure out a way to persuade the uh, publishers to get this thing yes. uh, back in print, so I can start assigning it to my students again. Uh, but um, well, you can you can you can sign chapters. <laughs> you can buy chapters from them. They charge you an arm and a leg right. for those too. But <laughs> well, we might have to do that. But John, thanks so much for joining me. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And, and uh, we'll, we'll continue the conversation sometime. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would like to to uh, at least hear this before we sure. Um, well, after you've yeah, after you've edited, let me uh, we stop it. Try to take it down. Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution.